So welcome, everybody. Um, this is, uh, I hope you all understand uh, what a groundbreaking, important uh, panel this is. I, I've moderated hundreds of panels in Washington, D.C. at the Associated Press, the Atlantic, and, and other um, activities, always involving Republicans and Democrats, and always only focused on the election. What does it take to win? How do we win? How do we beat the other guy? Zero-sum game. This panel isn't about um, what does it take to have independents win, but once independents win, how do they govern? How can they change uh, the way we govern, or govern and how can they bring um, a better politics? Um, so uh, we got a little, snap, a little snapshot of it from uh, Nick. Uh, now we're gonna bring some life to it from um, this incredible panel. I thought we'd start everybody if we could. And by the way, I, I want everybody in the audience to know that we wanna get your questions. If you have a question, even as it's going along, question pops in your mind, put your hand up. I'll, I'll acknowledge you, and then uh, when we get a break, I'll have you answer the qu ask your questions, even during the conversation. I would like this to be a conversation. So that means short questions, and it means gentlemen and ladies, short answers. Okay, and feel free to interject with each other as well. So let's start going down the aisle. Why is he here. looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm staring at you intently. Um, we'll, we'll start from uh, my left here. If each of you could take one minute and, and, and uh, uh, remind the audience who you are, but then, then tell them in a minute um, why it is you became an independent. Uh, sure. My name is Owen Casas. I represent Camden, Rockport, and uh, the island of Islesboro in the main House of Representatives. Um, I was elected in 2016. I ran in 2014 and lost, um, but ran again in 2016. One with a dozen votes. Um, so, I mean, it, it is difficult to get elected as an independent when you're running against the machine, but um, definitely uh, the view from the top is nice. Um, so I'm a Marine Corps guy, a construction worker, commercial fisherman, just a kind of normal person that tries to solve problems. Um, saw an opportunity to help out my community, help out my state by um, putting some of my efforts and skills towards some of that problem solving. And um, why am I an independent? I just always have been. Um, never registered for any party. Uh, like I said, I served in the Marine Corps. I didn't even vote until I think I was 24. Five, and um, by the time it got to the question of would you like to register with a party, I realized I had a brain, worked relatively well, I can read, um, and so I didn't think that I needed a party to help me um, figure out what decisions I wanted to make. You had a brain. That's, that a, brain? that's a lead so far. We got a politician with a brain. <laughs> one for one. Yeah. Keep it to a minute uh, if you could. Sure. Sir. I'm Jason Grand. I serve in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. I ran for the first time in 2016. Uh, when I ran, I, I signed up on the deadline day, an hour before the deadline. I was a registered Republican at that time. Uh, I live in a, a re Republican district. There was a Republican incumbent. Uh, that district ended up voting 55% for Trump. But when I decided to run for office, um, I, I found myself and many of my peers and many people, my neighbors, who just wanted solutions. And um, as someone who, who considered himself moderate, uh, I wanted to be able to go door to door knowing that was going to be the only way I had a chance to win was talking to neighbors. I wanted to have a clean slate of conversations. People who wanted to ask me questions, I wanted to ask them questions, uh, what it meant to be independent, uh, what, I, what I thought about certain issues. And it's, it's a fantastic, I mean, I, I know everyone in this room can, can speak to that, but um, I ran as an independent to open up the door to have just one-on-one -on -one conversations with neighbors and learn from them and hear from them and serve them. Um, both sides of the aisle without having to look at a party platform. Thank you. Thanks. I'll we'll just stand up for this part because this chair is kind of sucking me in. So I'm, a, I'm Marty Groman. I'm an independent state representative uh, and candidate for U.S. Congress from Maine. And I can sum up my candidacy and why I'm an independent in just five words, which is uh, not a party line voter. And if you wanted to imagine a dream scenario for an independent running for statewide and national office, it would be this. More registered independents. An independent senator. A working House independent caucus. And ranked choice voting. We have all of those things and more going for us in Maine. And because of that, nobody says I'm a spoiler. Everybody says I'm a winner. I built a business by bringing people together, and that's what I do as an independent candidate every day. Thank you. Sherry Jong, state senator right here from Colorado. 
served in the House for eight years and then ran for the Senate um, in a primary <coughs> one and served um, eight years, just finishing my last year in the Senate. And so I am term limited after 16 years. Um, I changed my affiliation, which many of you have already heard, from a Democrat to an unaffiliated. I was always very independent in my votes because that's just the right thing to do. But it has become so polarized and um, I feel that the party had moved so far left and I was so tired of fighting the battles of voting how I vote that I just said, you know what? I'm being disingenuous. I raised my kids to always, always be true to themselves. And here I was being dishonest. I am an unaffiliated, I'm independent, always have been. And I said, it's time that I serve out my last term as an independent, who I really, really am. And I want to work with everyone. So thank you. Thank you. I probably don't need two microphones. Uh, Representative Laura Sibilia, I'm from Southern Vermont. And I've served two terms in the Vermont House. I'm running unopposed this time, finally, uh, for my third term this year. Uh, why did I run independent? I was originally recruited probably four, I think it was four years before I actually ran by the Republicans. And I said, I'm not going to run as a Republican. Um, you know, I'm socially liberal. And the Democrats are really taking it too far in this state. Um, so I'm not going to run as a Democrat either. <clears throat> I had little kids time to think about it. Uh, my job was in economic development, uh, in a really rural part of the state, a state that was in decline, far away from the state capital. Uh, I worked really hard with all of uh, our senators, all of our House reps, kept them apprised of what was going on and kept looking for solutions. And at the end of the day, they were not working on the issues for my district and for my voters. And you know, I ended up running as an independent to go and finally solve the problems in our district instead of national partisan agendas. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Byron Malott, uh, Lieutenant Governor of Alaska. And I just wanted to make Alaska better. Uh, I'm an Alaska native, a Klingit Indian. Uh, My mother never had a chance because of her race. My village was ignored for generations. I carried anger within me for 50 years at the majority population. <clears throat> but after getting slapped upside the head a hundred different ways and a hundred different times, you kind of get to a place where you say it includes all of us. <clears throat> it isn't just about my anger and my angst and my desire to, to deal with and create opportunity for people without voice and people without opportunity. And in 2013, seeing uh, our incumbent uh, Republican governor, and we've had Democratic governors the same way, uh, kind of living a hard-edged ideology that in some ways was a reflection of what we're seeing nationally. And uh, I just didn't want that in Alaska. We're far enough away, we're so small, we can be different. Uh, I thought about running, as, I wanted to run as an independent. Bill Walker already had that space. Uh, we had a Republican incumbent. I had a niece uh, who had been the 2012 uh, coordinator for the Obama campaign and she talked me into running as a Democrat for the uh, uh, support that a party could give. And I was registered nonpartisan at the time and I changed my registration to Democratic. I had been off and on a Democrat over my life. But the bottom line is I didn't care about being governor. I wanted to make Alaska better for the people that I cared about. And knowing that in order to make Alaska better for the people I cared about, we had to make Alaska better for everybody. So let's talk about that if we could. That's a, you began and ended your remarks with something pretty powerful. I just wanted to make Alaska better. That's what politics is supposed to be about, making our states better, making our cities better, making our country better. And like I said, the duopoly really now is more interested in winning elections, not making things better. 
So let's talk about specifically, pragmatically, for people on Facebook Live who might have doubts about this movement, for people in this room who might be worried whether or not this is something uh, that they can stick with. Let's talk about what is already being done on the ground and how, in your legislatures, how you've made a difference already, you and your colleagues have, have affected change because you are in that chamber. So home field advantage goes to Senator John. I would love to, to, you to talk about um, an incident I read about in this amazing report that the United America team put together where you simply just facilitated a conversation that affected change. One of the things that I learned very quickly when I first went into the House was that you need to build bridges and you need to have people where you can work with coalitions of people to get good things done. So for all of the years, that's kind of what I was known for down there. And when there was tough stuff coming through, generally they would come get me because this side wouldn't talk to that side or this side wouldn't talk to that side. But in the last session, um, transportation is one of the biggest issues that have hit the state. We have had no transportation dollars for ever and they just would not talk. It was Senate Bill 1, for God's sake. Senate Bill 1. <laughs> that means it came out the first day. And they just flat wouldn't talk. And so I went to the Republican carrying the bill and I said, gosh, dang it, get to the table now. And so we brought them to the table. We had the Democrats to the table. And I actually got some good stuff done. Now I also had to end up go counting the votes. Um, but it's, it's called building bridges, and that's what independents can do so well. They can build bridges <coughs> because they're not wrapped up in that partisan squalor. How were you specifically able to build a bridge that would not have been built had you not been there, had, had there not been an independent there? What difference did you make? Well, they just wouldn't come to the table and talk, neither one of them. They had dug their heels in because this side didn't want the Democrats to get credit for any kind of an amendment to do any kind of transportation, and. The Democrats didn't want the Republicans to get credit for doing any kind of a transportation so bill. How were you able to break that? that so up? I literally, do you, do you really want me to tell you them how I did it? Exactly. I went to Senator Cook and I said, all right, get your ass over here, sit down at the table. We're going to talk about this because this is what's going to happen if you don't. So that is called the get your ass to the table strategy? <laughs> so what you happened? Asked. What was his reaction? You asked. And so he just, you know, did the whole no. And I said, no, 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 that's unacceptable. People in the state of Colorado want a transportation bill. You have the means to take it. And if you don't, it's going to get hung around your neck. Now, this is a bipartisan issue. You all need to grow up. Put your big boy boxers on. They're going to put their big girl panties on. Get to the table and get it written. So, so there you go. That's what I said. Thank you. So we have, you asked. We, we have the Fulcum strategy and get your ass to the table strategy. Before I move on to Alaska, where some remarkable things have happened because of this movement, anybody have any questions for Senator John? We'll, we'll do more questions later on, but we'll jump right now if you want. Yes, sir. Or else what? Good question. Or else what? Yeah. You didn't just scare them because of your... Nothing would get done on transportation, and it would get hung around their neck because nothing would have been accomplished. And it was Senate Bill 1. It was a Republican bill to begin with. So you threatened the duopoly with gridlock? That's, a, that's an irony. Yeah, that's what, you know, yeah. Uh, and they question? knew that it was true, that it would literally get hung around their neck. So the, the question is, did you literally say that you're going to hang this around your neck? Was it a threat? Well, it wasn't a threat. threat. It was, you know what, everybody out there in the public is going to know because, of course, I'm going to say something because I think it's disgusting that you're not working together. And, you know, it's going to die and the press is going to want to know why. And I'm going to tell them. We have a question from one of my heroes in journalism, Mark Andraki. Um, so usually a transportation, building highways, spending money, all that kind of stuff is, is something that Democrats and Republicans Everybody hear that question? If they, if they both did it, they both would get credit, right? More can't understand why One Republicans side. and Democrats wouldn't work together. <laughs> yeah, it, it was the most, in 16 years, it was, it was the most hardest session that I had served as far as partisan politics had gone. Literally. The Republicans did not want the Democrats to get credit for anything, and the Democrats didn't want the Republicans to get credit for anything. And uh, you're right. Normally, that's an issue for crying out loud. That is not a partisan issue. And they literally didn't, because we're going into an election year, didn't want one side to get credit 
<laughs> and the other side. I just want to say, I think this is what people, we're not doing the basic work of governing when we can't do infrastructure stuff, right? And I think that is why people are becoming independents. And I just want to point out real quick that, um, you know, Senator John comes with legitimacy. If I was to try to do that to the Speaker of my House as a first term independent, that wouldn't have flown. But she comes with legitimacy, so I think there's probably some unspoken, uh, you, it will, you know, I've shown you what I can do in the past, let's get this done. Very good point. Anything else? So let's move to Alaska with uh, Representative uh, Jason Gren, who uh, was a Republican, and you flipped to independent, and that created a cascade of events that led to some concrete results with the help of the Lieutenant Governor. Can you kick that off for us? Sure. The, um, in fact, the first two years of Lieutenant Governor's term, uh, you know, Republican House, Republican Senate, and partisan politics had stopped a lot of things from getting across the finish line. Uh, very, very much needed uh, economic changes to fix what was, um, we were dealing with three, four billion dollar deficit, three, three, four billion dollar deficits. I mean, just draining our savings because politics was getting in the way of solutions, which was really what was a catalyst for me to run. And, I, and I'll, I'll speak for the Lieutenant Governor. I'm sure he was pretty happy that we created this bipartisan coalition in the last two years of your term because- So tell us um, how it came together. <laughs> You know, um, it's it's magic and it's and it's secret sauce and it's everything else. Uh, when I when I uh, give us your anecdote sure. with a swear word, in it. Yeah. that's what we're at. When I when I signed up to run, I did not think about how to start creating a caucus with another independent, with how many Republicans and some Democrats. It really was I wanted to run so that if I did win, I could be a voice for people who were going to move us forward to, in, the, in a, in a so comprehensive fiscal we, plan. When you did win, the Republicans had 21 out of 40 seats, Democrats had 17, and there was two independents. Correct. What happened next? How do we get a coalition, uh, a, 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 a governing coalition? So you're, uh, you're intoxicated with happiness on election night and everyone's uh, trying to you know, run around, figure this out. And I had a phone call from a couple of Democrats who said, you know, it looks like tomorrow morning we're going to get together and see if we can count 22 people in the room. We don't know who's going to show up. Um, would you like to? Uh, that's kind of a scary thing, obviously. You, I mean, you're, you know, going to a room and not know what the future holds. Um, honestly, I thought I would have received the same phone call from the Republicans. They had had, uh, tr they had 21 Republican victors. You add one or two other independents, you, you're still in the majority. That phone call never came. So what happened instead? I went to the hotel room, walked into a room, and there was 21 other people there. Um, so you had the 17 Democrats and two independents and three Republican moderates? Correct. Yep. So describe that room for us. And, and So when you walked in, everyone else was there, and you realized you're one of them? In, in uh, the I, I think I was the last one. Um, there might have been one or two other people. I, I, I'm pretty sure I was the last person to walk in. Um, and you know, it's the day after the election, you're up until 2 a.m., you have no idea what's going on, and um, you sit in this room and you look, and I mean, it was a I was a little dumbstruck thinking, someone had managed to pull this off. Someone had, had, made, had, had done the calculation behind the scenes. It wasn't me. Do you know who but, did and how it came together? Um, there, the Republicans who, who did come on board were, in the previous session, had, had started to get elbowed out by the Republicans, you know, so they obviously felt a need to change direction. Um, you had some Democrats who upset, um, had some upset victories that we didn't see coming. And so like I said, a lot of ways it was, it's good timing, it's magic, it's a little, it's a little bit of everything. But um, was, there, it, was it a done deal when you walked in or was there a moment where you guys, uh, there was a laying of the hands and you said, okay, we're gonna go forward? No, I, I, well, there was, you know, obviously you get that sort of spectrum of people in the room from all sorts of places of Alaska, rural, urban Alaska. Um, you're not going to be able to agree on everything. What we did agree on was that a comprehensive fiscal plan has to happen, and that might mean new revenue. In the state of Alaska, we don't have a state income tax or state sales tax. We need to discuss that. Um, we have a permanent fund dividend that we send out to every resident in the state, a, a check from our oil royalties basically every year. Um, we might have to start talking about um, reducing that to start paying for public services. Are we willing to take unpopular stances um, and govern and be mature and act as adults in, in, in our role um, at the sake of perhaps um, you know, not winning the next election. So out of that came $85 million in budget cuts, 
um, a, a re reduction in the the, the state uh, the money that goes from the oil fund, mm -hmm. which is taking money out of people's pockets. Tough thing to do. Yep. A progressive income tax, the first ever in the state's history. Correct. Uh, it had passed the House. It did not pass the Senate, but it did pass the House. We did send send that over. So, Nick, is this an example of the fulcrum strategy when just a couple independents in a narrowly divided legislature, along with a couple moderate Republicans, were able to seize power and change the dynamics? That's that's what you're looking for to do in state after state. So, is that is that reasonable? Could it be done in other states? How many other states are close enough where that can be done? Thirty-one. So, Lieutenant Governor, was this just magic? Is this a quirk that can only happen in Alaska? Or is this, and by the way, you're a affiliated Democrat, or is this something that uh, could be a model in other states? I'm not sure about <coughs> being a model. Uh, there were a number of factors at play when Bill Walker and I essentially upset the apple cart. We literally did. There was a strong Republican majority in both houses. They were in, in clear alignment with the incumbent governor on a whole range of public policy issues, uh, including not accepting Medicaid expansion, uh, a, a very close working relationship with the oil industry, uh, uh, powerful lobbyists, and. That's something to talk about at some point, our lobbyists. It's just not legislators sitting there talking to one another. At least in Alaska, they're well, powerful. Well, 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 tell us how this coalition was able to push back on the power lobbyists well, in Alaska. Well, <laughs> what happened was, I think, in some ways, our example as an independent team uh, helped. Uh, it was clear that the Republican majority, if re-elected, would take us in the same direction without change. Um, there was a reality facing us of a multi-billion dollar budget deficit. Um, the, there was in the general, no, in the primary election an upset in rural Alaska where a long serving Democrat was upset by a much, by virtually an unknown but popular at the time Democrat. And I think that sent a signal that change was in the air because that sitting Democrat had been a strong leader in the Republican uh, 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 so coalition. Is, is it possible, and let so, me interrupt if I could, is it possible sure. to take us behind the scenes and, and give us a little blocking and tackling on how you and the governor were able to uh, exploit or and or work with this coalition to bring about um, uh, this this four bill package. 2016 was an expression of frustration in Alaska. It was an expression of what was going on nationally and which was happening nationally and seeming to be growing, not diminishing. It was a sense that we needed to deal with our fiscal circumstance. We were spending down uh, all, of our, all of our reserves. We did not have a direct role in creating the coalition. We certainly supported uh, the, the, uh, the, the leadership lineup uh, and made that known. The coalition, the changes came from individuals who had been strong supporters of the Republican coalition, strong opponents of the governor and myself, and every single one of them lost. Powerful signals uh, is all I can say that, that gave rise to leadership and others being able to say, hey, we have some room now, let's run. Jason, how important was it um, for the independents and the coalition that the governor, lieutenant governor, um, did they endorse you? Is that the right word? Did they embrace you? What's, what's the right word? Um, I, I don't think, I mean, uh, not out loud, not directly, but knowing that I, I had seen what the governor and lieutenant governor had done the two years prior to me serving and, and being elected, um, the hard choices that they had had to make. And I was on board with those choices. So knowing that if we would have, if, we as a new coalition 
sent that package to them, I mean, they were on board. So that, I mean, knowing that you have a, you know, you, you're, you're, they're ready to, they're ready to help. They're ready to, you know, use that bully pulpit a little bit. Um, it, it certainly, it, it, it probably helped cross the finish line. It really did. Um, the first year serving, it was, you know, partisan politics was still um, at play. It, we had extended sessions, but the second year we really did um, a great job working with the governor's office, working with his team to get uh, a lot of these across the, across the finish line. Any questions for the quick, Alaskans? Uh, yes, sir. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, so I, is this on? I don't know. So my name is Jacob Lupfer. I am a strategist in Baltimore, and I am pretty new to being an operative in the independent movement, but I was motivated to get into this by reading an article that came out in Politico magazine about a group of strategists and operatives in Alaska, the Ship Creek Group. And I just wonder if those of you uh, who have you know, worked with, one of the things I see is it's sometimes hard for independent candidates to get really good pollsters, really good strategists, and stuff like that. So can you say something about, uh, about how you find people to work with that have helped you along the way? Good question. <laughs> so actually, um, Ship Creek Group um, was my, uh, my campaign team. Um, they had been uh, active in previous elections, looking for candidates, talking to people in, in swing districts, districts they thought candidates were vulnerable in. They are kind of a full package deal. I, you know, I'm the candidate. They take care of my donation reporting, my graphics, my website, uh, my walking lists, things like that. Um, obviously, it comes at a cost. They're, they're, um, but as a first-time candidate, especially without a party infrastructure, um, in a state house race where you need to raise anywhere from fifty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand um, dollars, I couldn't have done it without some some strategists and experts. And we're going to so, put a pin in that. I think we could talk forever about how that's one of the many obstacles independents have. But I want to get through the rest of the panel with the time that we have. Let me jump to Maine if I could. We'll just, just hang on to that. We'll get back to you. So uh, Marty and, and Owen in Maine, uh, Representative Marty Groham and, and Owen Casas. Um, can you talk about um, how you guys helped forge a compromise that uh, changed tax law in the state? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that on. So we, we uh, and then I'll hand it off to Owen. So um, I'm a business guy, uh, started in, and ran a, uh, a successful business in Maine. That's a lot of my passion. Um, when, we, when the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, passed uh, federally uh, for a lot of states, including I'm sure others on the panel, it, it's created a, a, a discord between the federal and the state policy, and uh, it's created some problems and some opportunity, I would say. And, we, and our shorthand for uh, talking about that is uh, tax conformity, which uh, conformity is probably kind of a funny word for the independents to use. So what did you guys do to, to affect legislation? Let's get right to that. You know, what I essentially, together with the other uh, House independents, worked very hard. I think this is a point that we need to continue to make on this panel is, frankly, that I think everything is harder for us as independents. We have to drive harder. We have to knock harder. We have to fundraise harder. We have to push so what, harder. What did you do in this case? I called a lot of experienced tax lawyers and asked them what would be the right thing that's the best way forward for Maine. And I think the magic of the proposal that we made was as they say about good legislation, there's something for everybody to hate. And uh, <laughs> I think that's where we ultimately got. And I think, uh, and, and uh, maybe you saw this here in Colorado too, is w when, you, when you pull together a proposal, it's something about being able to attack a proposal that's good, right? If, I, if, if it's not my idea, then I can tear it to pieces. And I, I kind of thought in this case, it was a good role for the independents. Let's put this thing out here. We put it on a piece of paper. We frankly put it on a big poster. And, and look, you know, probably eight out of the ten elements that we put in it were ultimately uh, before the House now. And, and that, I think, was a really good role for independents to play to find that middle ground. Yeah, and to um, just kind of, I mean, this, this whole panel is about governing, right? <laughs> and so you know, the campaign's over. You've got to figure out who the players are in this game and, and how to work them. And when the numbers changed in the House, the governor saw an opportunity to pass legislation. His veto allowed to stop legislation, but he needed numbers to pass legislation. So we kind of capitalized on an opportunity where the governor was intrigued by us and reached out. We knew we had to do tax conformity. So you start reaching out, you start having conversations. We met with his um, tax guy, 
Uh, he apparently came back to us next time and said, well, I reported back to the governor. This is the best meeting we had had. It went horrible with the Republicans, and it's a Republican governor. It went not so well at all with the Democrats. So we're kind of inclined to work with you all. So from that, you still just continue to find those key players in the game. I'm not a tax guy. I'm not a small business owner to the same degree that Marty is. Marty was the, the point nuts and bolts guy. But what the rest of us were doing, we're trying to tee up meetings for him. All right, so who's our next tick that we have to get? Okay, obviously we have to get the House Chair of the Taxation Committee. He's a Democrat. So let's set up a meeting with him, figure out what the Democrats are looking at here. All right, let's meet with the Republicans. What are they looking for? What are your go? What are your no-go things? What are your high priorities? And from that, we kind of let Marty and some of the other independents and all the things that he was just describing sketch out what we thought was something that was uh, stood a chance to pass. And we really met very little resistance from the governor, which is odd in our state. So again, uh, done a lot of these panels. How often do you hear somebody going through exactly how you govern uh, like that? It's pretty remarkable. Uh, before we get to Representative Sebelia, we have two questions. A gentleman here, and there's a gentleman back there that we'll come to next. Yes, sir. You can keep it short. Please. other body I'll take a real quick whack at that and then pass on the microphone so we independents are independent <laughs> right so we but I think when we work we find issues where we do have alignment and we know that we can work together and and we identify those early we can be especially powerful um, Oh, just because we're we're doing Maine, so one of the ways that I've tried to describe, only two of us were elected as independents and then five folks left the party over time. So when you're trying to deal with folks that have left a political party because of disenfranchisement, it's like trying to build the plane as it taxiing down the runway. However, you're trying to build a standard normal plane and everyone's going, I hated that about the other party, don't do it that way. So it's very, it's difficult. Um, We've, you know, tax conformity is kind of one of our big wins. Uh, that said, we made this all up as we went along, um, and so we're very excited about the potential to have independents be elected in greater numbers and build that coalition at the beginning, kind of more similar to how Alaska did it versus as we progressed through the session, getting more members here and there. It made it more of a hodgepodge and slightly more difficult. Nice segue to Jason. You want to add something, sir? Sure. You know, the... Um in the, in the first year that I was serving, we were trying to get towards, we were in extended sessions, and the governor's office was offering these compromises to get us out of, out of uh, to gavel out, to adjourn. And I, <laughs> frankly, was, was really the only one in my caucus who said, this is a good deal, like this is a good compromise, this is for everyone. This makes sense for Alaska. We can, we can, you can, we can do this. And everyone in the caucus um, was, no, we can do better. We'll, we'll, we'll hold out, we'll hold out, we can do, we can do better, you know? Um, that allowed me to work with the governor and talk to the governor's team about, you know, how can I help? Um, knowing that there's, obviously, we, we saw eye to eye on this issue, um, but it opened up the door, and I think it was because we didn't have to talk to about party platform or what this was going to do in terms of, um, you know, moving forward, you know, for, for the elective. But, a discussion without baggage. But it, it, was, it was great. Um, and um, day by day, added people to understanding why this compromise was good. And uh, it was, it was, but... If um, you know, having an independent, talk to an independent uh, worked out really well. Thank you. Uh, we we want to get to Representative Sebelia, but we have a question over there. If you could keep it quick, sir. Yeah. Do you accept uh, PAC and special interest funding? And how are, are you lobbied differently as an independent by uh, special interests and PACs? Mm. Let me go down the road real quickly with that one. Do you? Um, Maine has a, a great ca public campaign finance system called the Clean Election System, so I'm not allowed to accept any PAC money or work with PAC folks. And um, the lobbyists in Maine aren't really all that bad. Um, they perform a kind of necessary evil. They really don't lobby us super hard. Um, like my good friend Senator Carpenter says, he can count on one hand with fingers left over the amount of folks he's worked with in the Maine state legislature that he thinks are legitimately corrupt. So I'm not going to speak to the other states. Maine's doing an okay. No. Jason? <laughs> uh, I, I, I do uh, accept PAC checks um, and 
and other checks, uh, our maximum is $1,000. So in terms of what might feel like a, of an influencing um, you know, check, it, it, it it doesn't. It, it doesn't come up to me. Yeah, I mean, just, um, I take it b mostly because I, you know, agree with their stances on on issues um, and and pr a proponent of what they're trying to do. Uh, in my run uh, for election uh, two times to the main house, I have used our uh, clean election system. Uh, uh, in my run uh, for federal office uh, for the U.S. House of Representatives, we don't have that system within Maine. Uh, I'm fundraising hard every day and, and uh, building bridges uh, everywhere I can. Senator John? I had always taken um, PAC money and small donor committee money. Um, it never meant I guaranteed my vote to anybody, and they all knew that. What they mostly wanted was make sure that I had an open door so that they could at least speak to me, and that certainly made good sense to me. But I'll tell you what, I don't know how you run a campaign without doing it. My last race in 2014, just on my side to win, when my party turned their back on me and would not come help, try to figure that one out, we had to raise a million dollars on my side. The Republicans against me raised over a million dollars. So. I don't even know how you do that and compete and get your message into these people's hands without using the funds that you can get a hold of. We're all big people. We can stand there and, and make our vote. We don't have to vote because somebody gave us money. That is, would be, that's just disgusting. Well, that's a, before we get to Representative Sevilla, that's a very good point. Uh, you can't win elections without money. Um, and you especially can't beat the duopoly without money. So that's something we could talk about an hour, for an hour. But we only have a few more minutes, and I would like to hear uh, your story in Vermont um, about what you, what you did um, that a Republican or Democrat could not have. Well, I will also say I do not take PAC money. Um, I have a very small district, uh, which I think allows me to do that. If I wanted to run for a statewide office, I would have to evaluate how that, uh, I would have to really think about that. Um, in Vermont, we do not, we're not close to having a, a fulcrum strategy count, uh, but I think we do have, we have seven uh, elected independents, and so, and we've had them for 10 years, growing numbers uh, for 10 years in Vermont, and so we're credible, um, and, you know, I asked my husband before I came, you know, what should I say about the Vermont independents, and he said, you know, it's, they're really a barometer. Um, and they're a barometer for the parties themselves. So when we're having uh, discussions about policy, if you end up with all of the independents agreeing to a position, which does not happen often, uh, it, it says something to the parties. Uh, you've either gone too far or uh, you haven't gone far enough. Uh, and so there have been a number of um, there have been a number of contentious budget votes where that has been the case. I would say one thing that the independents have done, one policy piece that we've done in the House, and my colleague uh, Ben Jickling is here, worked with me on this through a rural caucus, which was bipartisan, tripartisan, and I don't even know what you say, tripartisan plus independents. Uh, <laughs> we we were able to put forward legislation. The governor had uh, put up a strict uh, vetoing any tax increase. Uh, and we said, well, you know, nobody's making investments in infrastructure for broadband connectivity. We have to have it. Um, we're putting forward this, uh, this proposal. I had polled in my district on it. I had asked people. They were overwhelmingly in favor of it because they don't have connectivity. And we were able to pull together uh, 110 votes tripartisan plus independence, uh, which is a veto-proof vote uh, out of the House for that. Uh, we were unable to get our Senate colleagues to take that up, unfortunately, and test the governor uh, on that, but I think we'll be back on that issue. So. That's a good example. I think we have a question from Facebook. Yeah, uh, a Facebook listener asked, what are the issues that you hope to work on next legislative session? Jump in. Yeah, you know, for, um, this past session as an independent, um, I worked a lot on legislative ethics reform. We were able to pass um, a bill, I, th I think Dan's probably here from Represent Us, who worked with us on a ballot initiative that eliminated a lot of legislative perks, like per diem, if we go past special session. It eliminated lobbyist meals and drinks. It eliminated uh, foreign travel junkets for legislators, so a lot of things like that. Um, looking forward, I'm still... Um, going to be focused on things like that that just build trust and as an independent I think I can do that um, 
in different ways and even better ways than Republicans or Democrats can because it doesn't look like I'm attacking, uh, you know, a party. I'm just doing it for the betterment of of, of governing. Um, so things like gerrymandering, th you know, anything that is going to, uh, you know, create transparency and build trust um, in the legislative reform, um, I I think independents can lead the way, and we're going to try that in Alaska. Any other next legislature plans you want to talk about? So I, I think a thing that's really exciting what we're doing in the uh, main legislature now. Obviously, I'm I'm uh, I'm making the move to uh, to Congress, right? Ideally, yes, I'm on my way. And uh, but we are working every day, weekly calls with Representative Casas and other. We're building our bench. And I think it looks great for next session. And I think the independents are really going to be able to drive continued progress and just make things work more smoothly. I think looking federally, something this is. Can you, get, can you give us an idea how big you think that bench might get? How, how you We've got strong candidates running. Uh, you want to comment on that one, Owen? I just, I, I think that you know, there's the possibility of potentially eight folks being elected as independents between the incumbents and the new folks. Um, I mean, and when you talk about priorities, we could tick off uh, infrastructure, public education, Medicaid, oh, heroin and opioid epidemic, all those things. But for me, it really f centers on functioning government. If you don't have a government that can function well together, then why even take up these big issues? The example I love to get is it dropped on party lines, exterior lighting on a historic building that was also a public safety building. That was a partisan, you know, I didn't understand why it was a partisan issue, it didn't make any sense to me at all, but it really was a great example of if we can't even figure out exterior lighting on our historic buildings, <laughs> How are we going to figure out Medicaid expansion in any sort of comprehensive, coherent way? So for me, if we don't have functioning government, we really don't have much. I'd like to make a quick comment on governance, if I can, related to what we've discussed about, discussed, <laughs> discussed, <laughs> some of that too, uh, about our state and what an independent governor can do. The last session prior to an election is typically a session in which people are focused on running. And we had conversations in our cabinet and among the governors and my policy advisors saying, well, we aren't going to get anything done this last session. Uh, that's just the way it's done. And the governor and I had never run for statewide office before, hardly run for office. We've been mayors. Uh, and we looked at one another and said, whoa. <laughs> So the governor made a very strong state of the state speech, in, including ethics and other things that uh, Representative Gren has talked about. But he emphasized, we're going to continue working until this is done. Uh, election be damned, essentially. Because the governor had called the legislature into special session uh, more times, I think, than any other governor ever has. Uh, and that threat was there. And I think that that was very important, where if a either party had been in office, I don't believe that that focus on getting it done in the last session prior to a major election would have happened. Thank you, sir. Representative Sebelia, you want to answer the question? It, it was really around policy initiatives for next year, and I have we we do have a third party in Vermont Progressives who are organized as a major party. We have a senator who's tried to do rank choice voting for a number of terms, and I've talked with him, and we will try again, uh, introducing it in the House and in the Senate uh, next year, as well as we'll be back with connectivity. <laughs> do we have any any questions out in the audience? We have about five more minutes. How much time do I have back there? Five, any more questions? Yes, sir. I didn't hear the question. What was the question? Uh, you, even though you didn't, this is not governing, but how do you finance your campaigns, particularly for independents, when you're facing the two parties? That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, for me, as someone who was running for the first time without a party and maybe not understanding how much party support actually happens, um, it was very eye-opening. I just, you know, started calling friends, neighbors, your network, um, and then once you're starting to get taken seriously, um, business leaders, um, community leaders. Uh, for me, that took about three months. I started in June, uh, started door knocking, doing all that. Come around Labor Day was when I actually started having um, 
some of those max donors from, from business leaders and important people who you know, might be uh, worthy of an endorsement. Um, but it took time. It took, it took hard work and it took a lot of time. Is money the biggest obstacle to raises? So I would not be the person, I think, to talk about that because it's such a low dollar amount in Vermont. But I will say the first, my first campaign, it was friends and family. My second campaign, I actually got a lot of bipartisan support um, from other leaders in the state who said, you know what? You're doing a great job. We need, you know, competent legislators who are not, you know, who are willing to just come to the table. So, I think clearly it's a major obstacle. I mean, we have things going for us in Maine. Maine is a cheap media mar market, and I think that's good. But I'm, all, I look at it this way. Look, yes, it is harder for an independent to raise money. You don't have the party machine. You don't have the uh, the structure built up. It's almost as if you started a business completely on your own, or if you bought a franchise, right? You could look at it that way. Yeah. So you, you've. Um, but I'm a startup guy. I'm an entrepreneur. I feel good about that. And I know that when I get there, I'm not going to have somebody putting me under their thumb telling me what to do. So Owen, you, uh, when I asked that question, is it the biggest obstacle, you, you mumbled no. No, I, I mumbled no, but I, the caveat is that all politics are local. So, I mean, in Maine, I, I feel uh, unqualified to answer this question because I've run as a clean election candidate my uh, whole political career. Um, it's really difficult for me to ask folks for money, especially most of my friends don't have a lot of resources, so asking for five dollars is difficult enough. Um, so for Maine specifically, the, the biggest hurdle is getting out and talking to your friends and neighbors, knocking on doors, because we're accustomed to independence in Maine. They want to figure out what flavor of independent you are. You don't have to explain what it means to be not affiliated with the party. They just want to know if you're super left, super right, right in the middle. So getting that time, relying on your family to get out there and knock on doors, but yeah, totally unqualified to answer the question about fundraising. <laughs> that was a, no, it was a great answer. We have two minutes left, so I'm going to ask you to ask a quick question to one person. Okay, uh, my question is, Y'all have said that it's difficult to, to one directed to one person. If you okay, I, it, whoever wants to answer it, just anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, this is how it's gonna go. He's a politician. But um, <laughs> is it ever easier to be an independent candidate? Like, are you all ever? Do the parties ever come to you and be like, "Hey, you're the swing vote. Can you help this?" Like, I feel like that's our power as independence, and, and I feel like answer. Sure. Well, I have to say all the time because they don't know where you're going to be. Mm -hmm. And, so. you know, they'll know sometimes you're there to help them get something across the finish line and then you're not going to be there sometimes, but always they will come to you because you are the swing vote. They, yeah. Your vote is not spoken for, right? That's right. Yeah. I think you're seen as more pragmatist and, and they, you can talk to other people to get more votes. Right. It's, yeah, it, it's a benefit. Thank you. Representative Sebelia, you want to say something? <coughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I would say they, parties always come as a, again, kind of that barometer. You know, like where are where are you on this, and are we going to have a problem? So, so look, everybody, um, our time is up. I think it should be clear after listening to this amazing panel that uh, this movement isn't just theoretical; it's already happening. Thank you very much. <laughs>